together. I think it's a very useful feature. There's some great things you can do in Photoshop, and there's some great things you can do. And let me get a new file in Photoshop here. Um, some great things in Photoshop you can do. And there's some great things inside of Illustrator that you can do. Oh, really? Oh, whatever. Hey, Jeff, I can Photoshop at home. Okay, good. I'm glad you have Photoshop and Illustrator. And Illustrator. Okay, so let me let me talk about uh, how to to do some of the things. Let's go first from Illustrator to Photoshop. So let's say I want to use this uh, cloud that I've made inside of of or I stole basically inside of Illustrator and I want to use it inside of Photoshop now this cloud is a vector image and when you go to Photoshop you want to make sure you try and keep your artwork in vector so that you can take advantage of all those vector features right scaling right and and so on so you want to keep these things in Photoshop. So even if you're using, let's say, let me open up a picture in Photoshop. Actually, let me open up a picture. And let's say that we have this beautiful scene here. Here's our, my, my flower. And I want to have a graphic of rain clouds in this image. So let's say we're making an ad or something, and we want to have a graphic of a, of, of a rain cloud in there. So I have a rain cloud that I've made. Oops, not there. Where is it? Oh, where's my illustrator? There it is. Here's my graphic, and I want to bring this into uh, Photoshop. So uh, one way to do it, of course, is I could save this. Now, before I save it, I want to shrink the artboard down to just the size of the graphic that I have. So probably one of the best ways to deal with that is to shrink the artwork down to shrink the artwork down so that only fits the artboard I meant only fits the artwork is you select the artwork you want you go under object artboard fit to artboard bounds or fit to selected art either one of these of course the artboard bound so again it's under attributes or artboard I'm sorry fit to selected artboard if I click on that it'll shrink the artboard down just to that uh, one of the challenges you have when you are actually working with um, Illustrator is that that artboard, sometimes when you import it into another program, let's say you import it into InDesign, it's going to bring the size of the artboard into InDesign, right? Or if I'm going to bring this into Photoshop, it's going to bring the size of the artboard into Photoshop. I want to shrink that artboard down to fit the artwork first. Again, it was under Object, um, uh, Object, Artboards fit to selected art. Okay, let's save this as an Illustrator file. So I can save that. And I'm just going to save it as Illustrator. Let's call it Clouds. And then uh, I save it. So it's a piece of artwork that I've saved. Use the default setting as in everything. So if I go over to my um, Photoshop file, and let me get rid of this. This is... And if you haven't taken my interface design class, this is kind of some of the things we make in interface design. We're like designing screens for apps. I offer it in the fall semester, not in the spring. Fall only. So maybe next fall if you want to come back. Okay, let's continue. So again, here's my, my thing. I want to bring my Illustrator artwork in there. So you can place it by going underneath File. And you have two place options. You have place embedded or place linked. Now, what is the advantage of both? Well, of course, if you, and this is in Photoshop, I'm going to bring the Illustrator file in. Uh, if you say place embedded, that Illustrator file will become part of the Photoshop file. If you say place linked, it'll, it'll have a linked reference to that original Illustrator file. And the advantage of that is if you change the original Illustrator file, it'll automatically update in the Photoshop file. Does that make sense? So linking things, you it stays the same, you know, the file embedded, it becomes part of it. And so um, those are some advantage. I'm going to use place embedded for right now. And I'm going to choose my um, clouds. And it's going to ask me a question. 
basically the question it's asking me is how do you want to bring this in now in Photoshop they have something called a smart object and what a smart object is is it says hey keep the original formatting of whatever you're bringing in so since this is a vector I'm gonna say yes I want it to be a smart object and over here it says crop of course I want it to just be the artboard or whatever remember we, we all of these will be the same um, and the reason why is because I've already shrunk the artboard down to the, the appropriate size. So you don't have to change any of that options there. And if I hit OK, there it is. It's called a smart object inside of Photoshop. You can resize it, and it'll keep its vector. You'll notice if I make it really big here, it's still vector. It's nice and sharp and clean. If I make it really tiny, it will keep its vector shape inside of there so it keeps its vector just fine and when you're done resizing it the way you want it if you hit the um, move tool here or the checkbox here it'll actually like sort of you know say hey that's it this is the size you want it but again it's a smart object in Photoshop and it's totally um, can be rescaled, still retaining its vector Im information. I can rescale it to big, and then again hit the checkbox, it's still vector. I can make it smaller again, hit the checkbox, it's totally editable. And the advantage of a smart object is it keeps the original um, vector information. Um, can I change the color? Let's say I don't want uh, black, but I want it to be. Uh, white and um, I got to remember how to do that there is a way to do that um, um, if I can remember uh, let me look underneath my here my my options here It's already a smart object. I don't know. I, I can't remember right now how to alter this. But let's move on. It contains that. Another way you can bring artwork over from Illustrator to Photoshop is to copy and paste. And to do that, if you go back to Illustrator, you can then select your artwork and use the Command C on the keyboard or Control C on Windows, copy it. And when I go back over to Photoshop, I can paste it by hitting Command V. Now, when you paste it, it's going to ask you again certain things. It's going to ask you: Do you want it to be a smart object? Do you want to convert it to pixels? Because remember, things inside of Photoshop are all made of little tiny dots it's called pixels. Or do you want a path or a shape layer? So you've got a lot more options when you're copying and pasting than you do with just placing it in. Remember, we placed it in Illustrator first. Um, smart object we already saw. It keeps its vector stuff just like we did when we pasted it. Pixels is not very useful because it re removes the um, removes the um, removes the uh, vector information. But path is very useful. Eh, somewhat we'll see that in a moment. But shape is probably the best because then you can change the color. Right? Remember before when I was trying a smart object, I was like, I can't change the color. If you choose shape here, and if I choose shape and I say, okay, shape, and I hit okay, it'll paste it. And notice it's already taken the color information that is in the um, foreground color and putting it in there. And to change the color of a shape inside of Photoshop is underneath um, window, I believe under info window, or no, properties, I'm sorry, properties window. Do we see prop properties? And uh, can I change the color here? I know there's a way to change the color. Maybe not. No. No. I don't know why it's. Uh, just dying here today for color wise, changing objects. Um, there is a mask here. There it is. Double click on the layer. Double click on the shape layer in the layer window will allow you to change it. There we go. It's right here in the layer window. Double click in Photoshop. 
And of course, I might want a nice white one. There we go. Look at that. How about that for a design? I guess we don't want it to rain on my flower. Okay, let's um, go from Photoshop to Illustrator. And, and what I want to show now is how to do vectors. And so let me, I think a good idea is, let's say that somebody comes to you and says, hey, we want to make a nice outline of a cat for a logo of, um, how about a pet, a pet, pet store or something. So we want to have a, a, an outline of a cat for um, a pet store logo. Let's say that. You say, oh, I can use the pen tool, and I can click, 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 and draw a cat. But that's going to be a lot of work. How about we cheat? And so I guess one of my whole point here is that I can use Photoshop to cheat to make the shape of a cat. And so let's go and steal a cat. I know stealing isn't good, but let's steal anyway. So I'm going to go to... Google and I'm going to type in um, cat and I'm going to type in cat images and here it is right here this is great great example here I want to have a vector of this cat right here this cat I could bring this into Illustrator click 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 all the way around or I could use maybe image traits but that, that's a lot of work here's a quick way to make this cat a vector really quick by using Photoshop and Illustrator combined. So to do that I'm going to of course bring the cat into Photoshop first so I'm gonna click on the cat there he is right there I'm gonna right click on that and say copy image right from the browser copy image right from the browser I'm gonna to go to Photoshop I'm gonna say file new in Photoshop well, that's not a very big file here, but let's hit OK. And then paste is Command-V. Command-V. There's my cat. So whatever. You get the cat from the Internet or wherever you want. Get it into Photoshop. So now what I want to do is I want to convert this cat into a vector. To convert the cat into vector into Photoshop, I use the, um, I use the, the selection tools. And then I... And if you've used Photoshop before, there's something called selection tools. So I select the cat and I convert it into a path. Remember, when you're using the pen tool, you're making something called a path, right? And it's basically you have the anchor points with the line between them, right? Anchor points with vectors. So in this case, I'm going to use the magic wand tool inside of Photoshop to select the white area, which is outside the cat. So in Photoshop, I use the magic wand to select the white area. But I really don't want the white area. I really want the cat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert the selection by going under Select, Invert. And now you'll notice I have a selection of the cat inside of Photoshop. So whatever. What the whole concept here is whatever. You have all these selection tools here in Photoshop. I can take any one of these selections and convert them into a, a vector. Okay? The whole concept here is these little marching ants, what they call the marching ants here, I can convert into a vector. To convert the marching ants into a vector, and then I copy and paste the vector into Illustrator. Okay, so here we go. To convert this into a vector inside of Photoshop, I go underneath uh, paths. The pop-up window is called paths. P-A-T-H-S, paths. And so you go to paths. In the paths window inside of Photoshop, you'll see there is some options along the bottom down here. You have these options down here. And this option right here is, is to make work path from selection. So what that's going to do is it's going to go and make a vector from the marching ants you see here in Photoshop. So if I click on there, you'll notice it already has vectors. You can see you can see the path already. See it? It looks like it does inside of Illustrator, right? I can now copy this work path right here. You see it right here, work path. Copy that and paste it right into Illustrator and then color it. So I can come over here now to right here where it says work path. Copy on your keyboard, of course, is Command C. Copy. Go to Illustrator. Let's make a new file. 
And then paste is, and I got a lot of windows. Hold on, let me let me clear my workspace here. Um, and paste it is Command V on the keyboard. Now it's going to ask you some options because it recognizes that you're copying from Photoshop Illustrator. Compound path fully editable. Do you want to be able to alter that or compound path faster? Of course, we will probably, you know, the cat is probably not going to come in perfect. You might want to adjust it. So I'm going to go with the first option, and I'm going to hit OK. And here's my cat. Again, it's just a vector like any other shape. You can make it bigger or smaller. Oops, I lost it here. It doesn't have any color yet. Again, you can color it. There it is. And you can stroke it if you want. And so instead of having to go, hey, 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 and hey, draw, what you, what you, what you, what you going to make? Oh, don't worry, I'm just demonstrating right now. You do not have to follow what I'm doing. Just, just, okay? Just pay attention. So again, a quick, easy way to make a vector is by using Photoshop. Whatever you can make as a selection, using any. There's a whole bunch of selection tools. I just use the magic wand, select the white, and it inverted it, right? And then made it into a vector, and then copied that using paths, P-A-T-H-S, and then copied the paths into Illustrator, and you can change it. Yes? How did you convert the bunch of ants to the path? Uh, in the paths pop-up window. Right here, in the paths pop-up window here. Oh, where's, where am I at? Oh, here, Photoshop. Oh. Uh, there's a little option right here. Oh, okay. Right here. Got it. Okay. And let's do the opposite of what we just did. Let's take a vector from Illustrator, bring it into Photoshop, and make it into a selection. You can just do the opposite of what I just did. So you can do something very similar inside of Illustrator to Photoshop. For example, let's do an example. Let's say I have this wonderful clouds graphic. Look at that. And I want to take that and bring this cloud graphic into Photoshop. But again, you saw that I can paste it as a pixels, right? But I can also paste it as a vector inside of um, Photoshop and alter it. Demonstrate. A, as a vector. Okay, so you can. Hey, don't play my video right now, dude. Wait till I'm done. Okay, so I can copy from Illustrator now, and I can go back to Photoshop, and just like we were doing before, you saw my. Uh, here it is, this one. And this time, if I paste it. Okay, remember we did smart object once. We did pass, or we did we didn't do pixels yet. We did pass. Uh, we did shape layer. This time I'm going to use pass. This time I'm going to use pass. So we did smart object when I imported it. Do you remember that? Uh, we haven't done pixels, but you can probably visualize what it's going to do. It's just going to convert it into dots. So I don't really use that. Uh, we did shape layer, and I was able to change the color. Do you remember that? This time I'm going to choose pass. And the reason why I'm going to choose Pass when I go from Illustrator to Photoshop is that you'll see it. It's hard to, to see this, but you'll notice there's these little lines right here. You can see them. Okay, these lines represent a vector path inside of Photoshop. Okay, they represent a vector path. And what you can do with this vector path in Photoshop is you can actually manipulate it just like you could inside of Illustrator by using vector tools. There's actually vector tools inside of Photoshop and they're here towards the bottom. See this little arrow? That works just like the white arrow inside of Illustrator. This white arrow right here in Photoshop works like the white arrow in Illustrator. And if I click on that white arrow, if I click on this white arrow, you'll notice you can click along the path and you have your whole vector, see it right here? And you got your whole directional arms like you would inside of 
like you would inside of uh, Illustrator. And so you have a whole working path inside of um, inside of Photoshop. Now, how do I convert this into color? You're like, oh, right, right, right. well, once you manipulate it, it's a vector path. Here it is. Let's make it a little bit different so it looks a little different. There we go. We got a bigger cloud here. When you're done manip manipulating the path, and I guess I could, now I'm going to leave these all alone. When you're done manipulating the path, in the path window, paths pop up window inside of Photoshop, you have a fill. Oops, I think I got to select the whole thing. Click. No. There we go. Click the, in, I'm, I'm in the paths window. I clicked off and on again. Select the entire path, and you have, um, you have, um, I thought you could do fill right here. It's not letting me do fill for some reason. I you could do fill and stroke right there. Uh, maybe you have to select it first. Yeah, here's a selection path right here. Load selection. Oh, there we go. It turns it into marching ants. They're marching ants now, and then I know there's some way to make a fill and stroke. Once they're marching ants, you can do anything. You can fill it with a color. Edit, fill. Oh, it's not even. Why is it not doing it? Oh, maybe I have to click here. I'm having problems here. No. Oh, maybe because I copied and pasted it into a layer that was already a layer. Probably should have had a blank layer before I did this. Let me try again. Let me start with a blank layer. Let me deselect that. Okay, here's my work path. Oh, that's the problem. Yeah. When I copied and pasted into Photoshop, I should have made a blank layer before I did that. It took that path and put it into an existing one that already has some stuff to it. So before you paste that vector into Photoshop, make a new layer. Once it's a new layer, I can manipulate the um, vectors. I can manipulate the vectors like I was, again, with this tool. And then I can... Again, there's a fill right here and a stroke, just like you have fill and stroke inside of Photoshop or Illustrator. I mean, you can do a fill right here; it'll fill it in whatever the foreground color is, and then you can even have a stroke right here, and it'll fill this color in. I believe. I don't know if I can change the size. I think this is stroke. Yeah, stroke. Yeah. Oh, with a brush. Oh, that's right. I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah, change that. There we go. Okay, so you can bring from Illustrator to Photoshop and Photoshop to. So maybe those will be useful to you. Think about that. I use I use both programs all the time, and being able to use both of them back and forth is very very useful. Okay, let's talk about other formats from Illustrator that we haven't um, seen before. And the one I'm going to talk about now is called the um, PNG file and JPEG and why you would want to use one over the other. So, for example, um, let's, let's get to, uh, let me open up another, um, let's say we want uh, this one. What is this one? Okay, here we go. This is actually not a vector. This is uh, I stole this from um, from the Noun Project. If you haven't seen or used the Noun Project before, the Noun Project is a, a is a website that has a lot of icons that you can download. So if you go to uh, again, it's called the Noun Project. I think we looked at it already. The Noun Project. And in the noun project, uh, you can search for any kind of icon you want. I, I would do. We're doing weather a weather app in the interface design, so that's why I have weather kind of looking things. But you can type in storm, storm, s t o r m, storm. I spell storm. Storm. Is it two O's? Storm. No. Oh. How about rain? I can spell that. There we go. There we go. Nothing's downloading today. The internet is too slow. Yeah, whatever. 
And what I do is once I get that, I take a screen capture because I don't have an account with them. I don't have an account because I want you to pay. So in, instead of paying, I can cheat and take a screen grab. And the screen grab I took was um, a screen grab is a PNG file, right? A screen grab is a, so this is actually a PNG file. Okay, this is a PNG file. So it's not a vector yet. But of course, um, I don't want to open it in Photoshop. I want to have it open in Illustrator. So in Illustrator, I'm going to make a new file. And I'm going to place that screen grab of that, which was this one. And here it is. So there's my screen grab. And then um, I want to do a couple things with this. Um, and I was talking in PNG for a moment. So um, I want to convert this to a vector. To convert this to a vector so that I can use it um, and do what I want to do is I go underneath the... Um, I go into the uh, uh, image trace and inside the image trace and we've already looked at image trace and if you remember in the image trace option there is an option at the very bottom under advanced called uh, ignore white ignore white right there if I click on the ignore white it is um, it'll get rid of all the white on the outside and just leave this as a vector so I'm just gonna hit trace okay so now it's a vector and it doesn't look like a vector, but it really is. Uh, in order to change the objects, I need to expand. So it's it's all objects by going under Object, Expand, and I go OK. And now it sees it. So let's change the color here. Let's change the color. Oh, I forgot. You got to give it color mode. Sorry, color mode. RGB. There we go. Under color, I had to convert it to color. Okay, so how can I take this and use it with other applications? I talked a little bit about InDesign. I talked a little bit about video. I talked a little bit about um, 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 Photoshop already. How can I use this? Well, probably um, let's talk about the two main file formats that you might be using, bitmap file formats, and those are JPEG and uh, um, PNG. So let me shrink the artboard down first. The first thing I'm going to do is shrink the artboard down to the size of the art, and to do that again is underneath Object, Artboards, um, Fit Artboard to Selected Art. There we go. And uh, uh, there's two things I'm going to demonstrate. I need two of these right now, so um, let me uh, duplicate this a little bit here. Oh, I can't shrink this down. Wish I could. There, there we go. I'm just demonstrating right now. So uh, I'm going to make two artboards for this right now. Let me make another artboard. Whatever. And let me duplicate that in there because there's two things I want to demonstrate here. And so let me demonstrate. Let me duplicate this. There we go. And let me shrink this down a little bit. Okay. So for this. Um, this next example, I'm going to save as different formats and why you would want to save these in different formats. So let's just talk about that for a moment. Sometimes you want to save it as a JPEG. JPEG is probably the most universal format in the world. The downfall of saving as a JPEG is the background needs to be the same as what it is. Because right now we have red kind of weather thing on a white background. So to save this as a JPEG, this, to save this as a JPEG, I'm going to go underneath File, um, Export, and now it depends on what version you're using of Illustrator. Um, what's going on? You're just listening to my demonstration. Can you sit down, please? Just just listen for a moment without walking around, okay?
Just sit down. Just listen. So uh, it depends on what version of Illustrator you have. Um, you have export for screen, export as, at least this version, and save for web legacy. Now, the word legacy means it's kind of old. And Illustrator for several years have, has had this thing called save for web. And what the save for web was, was a way of saving it in a variety of formats that you would then put onto a web page. So let's go over that just because those are very popular. So I want to save this for a web page. Um, save for web. Um, you have all the different options. And if you ha haven't learned all these options yet, you should know what each one does and, and why you would use them. Um, up here in the very top corner in the save for web option is you have GIF, JPEG, PNG8, and PNG24. These are the four kind of options. Okay, and let's talk about them for a moment. GIF is a really good format. Um, it was the original web format. If you looked at a web page in 1994 or 1995, you were most likely looking at graphics in the GIF format. Um, the problem with GIF, though, is it's only 256 colors or less. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't a very good colors for, for photos, but it was great for artwork like this. Also, the advantage of saving for a GIF is that it, it can save it um, with a transparent background. And you notice you can see the checkerboard pattern behind my artwork here, which means it's transparent. Um, and then, of course, there's something called a matte color here, and that's sort of what color does the edge kind of blend to. And usually the matte color would be the whatever color background your web page would be. That's what you would want to put there. And uh, the, the total advantage of a GIF is it was really small because of the way it compressed it. And if you look at this, you'll notice that um, I could actually reduce the um, color table down to just, just to about two. Maybe I'll do eight. And um, you'll notice it's only 4.5 kilobytes. Really, really small. That's a, that's a tiny file. So this was really fast to download off the internet. So GIF had some advantages that it could save as a very small file, which was quick to load. Let's look at a JPEG. A JPEG is a different compression scheme. And you'll notice if I choose JPEG to save this, you'll notice it's 21 kilobytes, a lot bigger. Okay. The downfall, though, of a JPEG is it can't have a transparent background. See? Can't have a transparent background. So the disadvantage, of course, of JPEG is that it's a bigger file, and it can't. But it's very compatible. Most things can use a JPEG. Then, of course, we can go to PNG8. The PNG is, um, and let's talk a little history here for a moment. Um, back in the 90s, there were really the two formats that you could put on a web page. You have the GIF and the JPEG. And you just saw some had advantage and some had disadvantage. And there was a lot of problems with them. One of the main problems with the GIF and JPEG in the 90s for a website is that the, there was licensing and you had to pay a license to use them. Well, at least GIF is owned by CompuServe. And then JPEG, actually, um, there was a format back in 1997. Um, there was a company that, that claimed that they owned the, the license for JPEG. And it went to court, and it got thrown out of court. And the company that claimed that they owned the license to JPEG was actually Intel. Intel said they invented JPEG. I don't know why. Say, hey, we own the license to JPEG, and of course it went to court. Uh, I don't know who was suing who or whatever, but it was thrown out and it's now Intel, you don't own the license. To it. And so it's an open source format. But some of the downfalls with those is that color information couldn't go along with the file. Like, and, and we haven't talked about color profiles yet, and I would love to talk a little bit more about color profiles, but there's something called an ICC profile. And that's color information that goes along with a file so that the file renders properly on the screen. Because think about it, back in the early days of the internet, let's say uh, you go to a store and you want to buy a t-shirt. Right? You go, hey, I want to buy that red t-shirt. 
Well, the monitors were not very good in the 90s. They were pretty crappy. They had VGA SMD. They were pretty crappy. So some person might go and see the red and it looks orange, right? And somebody looks at the red and it looks maroon or whatever. And so color balance was really difficult um, for early monitors and uh, file formats, graphic formats. So what they wanted to do was have a graphic format that could have color information that goes along with the file so that when it renders on the computer screen, it would look proper, no matter what monitor, because there's color information that tells the monitor how to display the image. And that is called an ICC profile. And so neither one of JPEG or GIF could have that. So they invented this new format called PNG, probably around 98, I would say. PNG came out in 99. And that's this one right here, PNG. And there's two versions, PNG 8 and PNG 24. And really what's the difference is a opacity option. Opacity option. Or blending edges. The edges can be smooth. So, um, and color information can be um, sent with it. I don't know where the ICC profile is in this window here, but there is a color profile that can be sent with it. So the PNG is fine. PNG 24 is the same here, at least here, because they're, they're pretty much the same. Um, this doesn't have a lot of color to it. But let's look at uh, another example. Let me hit cancel here for a moment. Let's look at this one for a moment. I'm going to select this artwork. And I, there was an option called Feather earlier that I didn't um, talk about in this class. And what Feather is is the same as you would have Feather inside of Photoshop. Anybody use Feather in Photoshop? Yes. Feather is what? A nice smooth edge, right? So you can do those nice smooth edges. It's almost like the blur. Do you remember when we did the clouds with the blur around the edge so it looked like it was fluffy on, uh, in the sky? Do you remember doing the clouds? And what the blur did was kind of just blurred the edge. Well, feather is a little bit different. What feather does is it kind of blurs the edges the way Photoshop would do it. So in, in Illustrator, if I want to have a nice smooth fuzzy edges or nice smooth edges, inside of Photoshop or inside of Illustrator I can go underneath the effects window and uh, no it's under uh, object I have to remember where it's at it's under object feather I know it's here somewhere and the feather beautiful thank you so it, under effect stylized feather it'll give you a number that you can put in and basically, it's it's kind of like the edge of the artwork and how how much you want to blur it. And if you hit preview, you can see what it's doing. And if I zoom in, oh, let, let me do a little higher. There we go. If I hit OK, it's kind of like the blur that we did. You can see the edge. Very similar blur, but it just does the entire edge and not just the, the blur does the whole object. And the feather just does the edges. How about that as the, the way of describing it? And what is the advantage here? Well, of course, we have a nice soft edge, but it comes down to the PNG format. So if I go on and save, go back to my file, save for web legacy, right here, and you'll notice uh, PNG or GIF doesn't do very good. GIF is, is going to give you kind of fuzzy edges here. But if I go underneath where it says PNG 24, you'll notice that you have this nice smooth edge like that and the advantage of this nice smooth edge is that your bitmap artwork will then go wherever you're taking it with that smooth edge for example if I was going to make an app where's my phone where's my phone If I was going to make an app, let's say for my phone, in there's a program that we use to make apps called Xcode, and Xcode wants to use a PNG file. That's the, the default format for things like photos, icons, and things like that. So if you want, right now, if I look at my 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 icons on the screen here. They have nice hard edges, like a vector would be, right? They have nice hard edges. But I could bring this in with PNG24 into my app, and 
and it could have the nice soft edges on the foam that ran the app on the machine. Okay, so the PNG24 with the nice soft edges, like even in Photoshop, say PNG24, it will have the nice soft edges, and if I import this into Xcode or I import it into InDesign, it'll still have these edges. Let's let's look at InDesign real quickly because I wanted to show InDesign briefly today. So let, I can save this. In fact, InDesign will accept this as a a a a, a Illustrator file with the nice soft edges, I believe, too. So. Let's save it as a PNG while we're here anyways. Oh, did it save? What did it do? Where was I at? Save for web. I was using PNG 24. Oh, got to hit save. Save. Uh, we'll call this uh, cloudy. Cloudy. Cloud? Cloudy. Cloudy. Okay, and then let's save this. Um, um, let me get rid of. Well, let's save this one. Yeah, I know. We, no, we didn't get to get to go to all these yet here. Um, let's save. Uh, what do I want to do? I want to save. I don't want. I don't want two artboards. I just want one. What if I just delete this one? Yeah, go away. Oh, but I want to save this. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this artboard. Hold on. Okay, there we go. One artboard. File. Save as. Let's save it as Illustrator. Okay, so if you haven't um, seen InDesign before, uh, InDesign is a um, pretty much, uh, let me get rid of this program. <laughs> Oosh, I got a big mess on my desktop now. So let's talk a little history here for a moment, of course. Um, let's say we were going to make a nice brochure like this. Okay. I wouldn't make it in Illustrator. I wouldn't make it in Photoshop. I would make it in a page layout program, or what we call desktop publishing back in the 80s. Can you have these all I'm just talking right now. You can't have to wait till I'm done. So in this case, you wanted to make a brochure like this, okay, you were going to use something like a desktop publisher. Back in the 80s, um, we used to use a program called Ventura Publisher. Anybody ever heard of Ventura? We used to use something called Ventura Publisher. That was one of the first desktop publishing programs. Then there was also one called Tape, not sure, yeah, Tape Maker. And then um, there was a, the most powerful and most expensive one was called Quirky. And the advantage of Quirk Express and why they were the most expensive is that the printing companies had printing presses that were linked to Quirk Express. And so the colors, if you wanted your colors to be just perfect, you wanted everything to be perfect, you actually had to use Quirk Express. And the problem though is that it was a perfect um, way of a, a you know, monopoly company overcharging people. Hey, if you want to do this, you need to pay us, you know, $2,000 to do that. I mean, literally, that's what it was. The use of the program was $2,000, you know. And all the publishing companies had to, had to use Quirk Express. Okay? You know, you wanted to work with this printing press, you need Quirk Express. You know, and they were from Colorado, and they were a horrible company, horrible customer service. They were mean, they were nasty. And so Adobe came out with InDesign, and said, oh, let's make our own. They, they bought they bought um, PC Publisher, or is that what was the other one I just said? All this Page Maker was another one that said they bought Page Maker, all this Page Maker. And they said, okay, let's make our own desktop publishing program. And they called it InDesign. It came out around 2000, I would say, 1990, 2000. 
And of course, Quirk Express was still the dominant company. But slowly, Adobe was able to work their way, hey, because they had Photoshop, they had other things, people were using those things. And slowly, slowly, they ate away at Quirk Express market share. And eventually, Quirk Express, have you ever heard of Quirk Express? No. See, they, they slowly were pushed out by Adobe, which is a dominant, now they're the monopoly, right? <laughs> but you got to pay them now by using InDesign. And InDesign works great because it works with all their applications very seamlessly. So how InDesign works, of course, is uh, we can make a new book, a document, book, or library. Document, have multiple pages to book, you don't need that, and so on. So let's say document, it asks you how many pages you want, what kind of starting pages, do you want it to be uh, facing pages, which would be um, Here's, here's one page. What would a facing page would be something like this, where you have one page here and one page there. That's what's called a facing page right here. Okay. So that's what this is, facing page, so on. What size? Letter would be 8.5 by 11. And it uses this crazy scale of, of, of pica kind of scaling, I believe it is. I can't remember. And then columns. How many columns do you want? Of course, this is a newspaper. Has three columns. One, two, three columns, four columns, so you can have a grid in there. So you have all the different um, options there. You got margins down here and so on. And when you're done, you hit OK. I'm going to use the default, and it gives you a page. Okay, and so you have a page, which is great. What you could do with this program then is you can make what's called a master. Because let's say you're doing uh, uh, a design like this, and you'll notice at the bottom of each one of these pages, this little brochure here, at the bottom of each one of the pages, they have a nice um, yellow bar with kind of the logo and a page number there, right? And the black line goes across the top. Do you see that? Next page, same thing, black line across the top, so on. It's on every page. So what you can do is you can make what's called a master, that master then could have the artwork that's on every page. Okay, you can do that. So let's let's make a little master. We'll use our 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 our, our cloud logo that you just saw in Illustrator. Because my whole point here is how do I bring artwork in? Okay. And so let's go to our master master. Where is my master? Pages, pages, here's my page, and here's master right here, and if I double click on it, it'll show me the my master page, of course my master page is, is, since I chose facing pages, it's got a master with facing pages. Once I have that, I could, just like you saw in the brochure, I could make a nice colored bar at the bottom, let's put a little colored bar at the bottom. And then I'm going to fill it up. Yeah, go get some water. And I can give it a color. And then uh, let's bring in our logo. I can place my Illustrator file right in here by using File Place like you would inside of, uh, just like you would inside of Illustrator. And, uh-oh, I had this, this selected. I, I'm going to undo that. Uh, I'm just going to put it. Yeah, let's put it here. There. And so you just bring an Illustrator file in. Um, let me move this stuff out of the way. And if this is a facing page, maybe I want it um, over here. You can do the option, click, and drag. Here we go. And so we have my blue bar at the bottom, and we can put our logo in there. Oops, it puts our text in there. Whoosh, ugly. Where's my font? Size. Hmm. 
Ranny? I thought it was Rainy. She spelled it wrong. Oh, Rainy. Okay, so I can bring any kind of Illustrator file right into the program. And I can make my master here. And once I'm done making my master, I can go back to my pages. And then, um, how do I get, how do I get out of master? Well, I can, I can make a new page. Here's my first page. No? Where's my, oh, here's my first page. Here's my first page. Since it's a single page, um, it has, um, just, it has the logo now and my, um, thing down at the bottom. Of course, I can do page numbering if I want and so on. I can make new pages. And again, this is to be a facing page, new page. You got page one, page two, one, two, three. I could have text run from one page to the other. Remember when we were doing the um, remember when we were doing the uh, poster and we had text run from one to the other. Uh, the other thing is, remember how I exported out that um, this kind of rain logo as a PNG? I can bring that PNG by using the place in. And of course, the beauty of that PNG is it has a transparent layer to it. So if I drag it, look at if I bring it over top of this, you can see the transparency there. See the soft edges. See how the the soft. So whatever color background it, it comes in, like that. And then of course I can have text. Oops, what happened to my thing? Oh, I moved the object without moving the box. I want to move the box. There we go. And just like you have inside of um, Illustrator, you can have text that runs. So I could have a text that runs. So just like I had inside of Illustrator, I can have text that runs as well as, remember how we were doing the um, multiple columns? And I could do text wrapping and everything. I don't know. Any questions? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. No, not necessarily. This is the you mean the purple lines right here? Yeah. Well, that's your kind of that's kind of your column margin. Um Yeah, you can adjust that depending upon who's publishing it and how far you want to bleed it. Um, it's not necessarily going to chop off from here to there. Uh, it depends on the printing and who, what, what, pu what, what kind of printer you're using. So yeah, this is not necessarily indicating that from here to here is going to be cut off. Um, I don't know. InDesign is a great program. Um, probably the greatest advantage now of using InDesign is that you can do an e-publish, publish online. And so um, you can make yourself a um, I'm, I'm making a plunger. Evil. It's a slip plunger sword. And so that, that's hey, very I'm a useful. Sword. So just come down here. It's all right. I'm almost done here. So let me let me stop this recording.